I have the privilege of introducing Rick, and I'll just say a couple things about him. He and I go back uh, all the way to college, knew his wife at Shenandoah Valley, and a lovely ministry and cup, a couple, a partner of ministry together. And um, Rick is currently at the Potomac Conference. He serves as the vice president for pastoral ministries, which means he pastors the pastors, he and his team. And they have an effective team there um, doing a fantastic job. Um, prior to that, he was the senior pastor at what was uh, once known as the Alder Grove Church up in British Columbia. You've probably heard of it. It's now called the Church of the Valley. But uh, if you know anything about that church, and he was the senior pastor, they were known because of their activity and engagement in their community. And so this topic that he speaks today is not just theory, it's not just academic, he's been there, he's done it, and uh, it, God has blessed his ministry, so he has something vital to share today. So we appreciate you being here with us today, and Rick, the time is yours, brother. God bless you. Thank you, Frank. Really appreciate it. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I love pastors. I spent 30 years pastoring churches before I moved into more of an administrative role. And I remember way back, uh, Mike, 1985, <laughs> Mike Spiegel and I were in seminary together along, maybe possibly with some of you. And I took, um, they, they had these tests called, uh, I forget the exact name, but they were by Eldon Chalmers. Yes. And they were able to determine your fit for ministry, your emotional quotient for ministry. The higher the number, the more likely you were going to survive as a pastor. We got the results back, and I had a negative number, <laughs> which meant they really questioned whether I was going to be able to survive ministry or not. And so uh, I don't see myself as the typical Adventist pastor. And sometimes that can be a challenge, and sometimes it allows you to think outside the box. And in this case, um, this is a time that it helped to think outside the box. Only we're calling this thinking outside the church. As Frank shared, this is about churches, how to reach your community in effective ways. And just um, maybe if you take anything from this, I hope it's that your juices get flowing and that you could come up with ideas as well, but I'm gonna share with you a bit of our journey just to let you know it can be done, okay? I want to start out by um, where you were on July 2nd, 2012. I love on court cases on TV where they say, where were you, February 19th, 1980? Who knows? You probably don't know where you were on July 2nd, 2012. But I want to tell you where a particular Adventist pastor was. His name was Eric Shaddle. And he was the pastor of the Richland Seventh-day Adventist Church. He was 56 years old, and he just had open-heart surgery a couple of months before. He decided that he was going to get on his bike and ride across America. When you do that by bike, it's about 4,000 miles. Why was he going to do that? Because he wanted to raise money to buy diapers. Now, you might, what? <laughs> Why would he get on a bike and ride 4,000 miles to raise money for diapers? Well, number one, he wanted to raise money for a million diapers because he learned in his community that poor families are often needing to choose between food, heat, or diapers. And so his church, the Richland Washington Church, became known as the Diaper Church. In fact, uh, this was a quote from one of their uh, resources. Families spend an average of over $100 per month on diapers for one infant. The cost forces poor families to choose between diapers and other necessities like food. Now, that was 12 years ago. I went to their website last week, and this is what comes up. If you had to choose, which would it be? Do you know? Parents in poverty often have to choose between paying for rent or food or buying diapers. 12 years later, they're still doing it. Now, why is, did Jesus say, go out and raise money to buy diapers? He didn't, but we all know that that saying that we've heard probably a million times, people don't know how, care how much we know until they know how much we care, right? 
when we reach the needs of people, it, it, it cracks to the shell open. It softens the soil so that when we go to speak to them about heavenly things, there's a receptivity there that would not be there unless we were meeting their needs first. I want to share a little bit about the journey of Church in the Valley. How many of you have ever heard of Church in the Valley in British Columbia? Okay, a few of you have. This church, uh, I'm going to share a few facts with you just to kind of give you a, a reference point. But the pastor who followed me, uh, Dr. Dave Jameson, who is now the Upper Columbia Conference president, uh, was interviewed um, a few years after I left, and we were, they were talking about how Church in the Valley has been able to position itself so well in the community. And he simply says, the people in our area have no church connections or ties. We pray for them, we minister their needs, and they come to church. Sounds simple, doesn't it? Well, in a sense, it is. And sometimes it's just the know-how to do it that gets in the way. This is now the church in the valley in British Columbia. When you look at it, does it look like a church? It doesn't. In fact, if you had a bigger picture, it looks like a sports uh, venue of some kind. And we're going to talk about this as well. Now, I realize you can't go out and change the physical look of your church. But there's other ways to kind of break down that missional barrier that people often have about churches, not just how they look, but what happens when they engage with churches or even when they go inside. You know this one very well. Christ method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior mingled with men as one who desired her good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, won their confidence, and then he bade them follow me. Now, it's interesting that when Luke was writing the book of Acts, he had been um, talking to some of Jesus' disciples. He did a whole lot of research. And after learning about God who came to earth to save men, when he tried to describe the life of Jesus, he did it in these five words. He went about doing good. And so that seems like an awful lot, what we just read in Ministry of Healing, page 143. Jesus was described as somebody who went about doing good. Now, in Church in the Valley, uh, let me tell you how this all started. Uh, the Church in the Valley, when I was there, known as Aldergrove, we had a head elder who had a vision. And it was kind of an anti-Adventist vision, if you will. And that's, this is what I mean by that. He said, Rick, what if we as a church were to do good things in the community without any strings attached? In other words, we often do the good things and we have a hook at the end. And that hook is hopefully that they'll jump on and we reel them in and we give them Bible studies and we are only ever doing good because we have an ulterior motive. Now, no matter how, how holy that ulterior motive is, you know, getting them to know Jesus, it's still an ulterior motive. So he thought, what would happen if we just simply did good for the sake of doing good and let the fruit fall where it may? And we said, let's try it. And so we formed a committee in this church, and we started to ascertain the needs of the community, and it was amazing what began to happen. In fact, Dr. Joe Kidder in his book, The Big Four, how many of you have ever read that book? Okay, all the Grove Church in the Valley is in that book. It's at the beginning listed as Church C. He doesn't list those uh, churches by name. Uh, but in that book, uh, he talks about how he went about doing his research. There are close to 5,600 pastors in North America, and there are about 4,200 churches, I believe. And out of those 4,200 churches, when you give the criteria of churches that have had a growth of membership of at least 5%, an attendance growth of at least 5%, for five consecutive years, there's only five churches that meet that criteria out of 4,200. Alder Grove Church in the Valley was one of those. And it did it by community engagement. And so this is also why I'm very passionate because I have seen this work. I, 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 I know what it can do for churches where they really start caring about their community. These are some of the things that we did there. 
We, the very first thing we did was called ACTS, A-C-T-S. It simply stood for Aldergrove Computer Training School. What we did is we set up a computer training classroom in our church and went out and found individuals who were either unemployed or underemployed, and we gave them computer skills so they could have a better job of going out in the job market and hopefully finding a better job. And we graduated, I think, close to 80 different individuals in this. The next thing we did was called the Breakfast Club. We decided that five days a week, we were going to go to the local public elementary school and give kids breakfast, a hot, nourishing breakfast. And so we simply contacted some of the retired ladies in the church. You know, retired people have a lot more time usually than you or I do. Um, and they still want to be used, very much so. And so we got this started, the breakfast club, and what began to happen was just, just wonderful to see these little children get food in their stomach that they didn't get before they left the house that morning. And we know that that affects their learning as well. Um, they give away, or we gave away, cars for moms, minivans. Just, we would find a individual in the community, a single mom who uh, was struggling and they just didn't have good transportation to maybe hold down the job or take the kids to school, whatever. So we would raise money and we would buy them a minivan and hand them the keys and say, this is yours. I have a video that might, if we have time, to show you one of those mothers getting that. Extreme Home Repair. How many of you remember Extreme Home Repair with Ty Pennington? on NBC when they would go to a house and completely make it over. This is something else they did. Uh, and they would get community people to be involved and they would find a house that was run down. Uh, people just couldn't afford to fix it up. They would garner the energy from the community and would spend about two weeks fixing up this house. Uh, a community Christmas dinner. These are some things that, that are maybe fairly common. Oil change, single car repair for moms. One thing that you didn't see in that picture of Church in the Valley this, that was built about 2015, it is the only church that I'm aware of in any denomination in North America that has a three-car automotive bay as part of their church. Just like when you go to get your tires changed or your oil changed or you, know, you have those bays, that is actually part of the building of Church in the Valley. And so they have this ongoing car repair, oil change things for, for moms and other people who may not be able to afford those kinds of necessities. And that's all, an awful lot of fun there. Summer camp for kids, free dental care, the list goes on and on. But all of these were things that simply said we care about our community. We want to be able to reach people just for the good of it. Now, an interesting thing happened on the way to the store, as I say. When you begin to reach people with no ulterior motives, they respond, come on, what's the catch? Nothing. We just, we just want to help. <laughs> really? And then they begin to become interested. Church in the Valley, our 4,200 churches, is now the fastest growing Adventist church in North America based on a community outreach model. Yeah, there's been some evangelism in there, of course. Um, but it, it, it's, it, when Joe Kidder did the research, he ruled out fast-growing immigrant churches. And he also looked at other churches right in the area of these five churches that rose to the top to see if there were other churches that um, maybe weren't doing quite so well, like, did the church in the valley have some kind of special advantage that other churches in the areas didn't have? And the answer was no. There were other churches in the area that were declined or uh, plateauing or declined. And that was true of all five churches. So church in the valley just simply took community outreach seriously and wonderful things began to happen. Let me tell you about another church. This is a... This is my church. I'm hardly ever there, but this is my home church in Buena Vista, Virginia. This church also is taking very seriously community engagement and just reaching out to people for the sake of reaching out. What is some, some of the things we're doing? Well, a few years ago, 
we decided to get a card, stick $20 in for every public school support staff there was in the county. And we said, go out and have dinner on us. There were 210 that met that requirement. Do the math. $4,000, right? Uh, gift bags for public school teachers. Uh, purchase and install playground equipment for the local park. Promise bags that we would give people who were going through difficult times. We have now done close to 20 Habitat for Humanity homes. Uh, coats and gloves, Thanksgiving food trays. The reason why I want to list things is these are not the typical things that you think of about community outreach. Almost every Adventist church has uh, you know, used clothing and maybe a soup kitchen. And there's nothing wrong with that, okay? Uh, what I'm just trying to show is that there are other ways to be engaged with the community besides just the typical ones we think of. And usually, usually they have a higher payoff. What I like to think of it is like this. Are you going to do something that if the local news channel found out, they would want to put it on their newscast? They wanted to put on about extreme home repair. They wanted to put on giving moms cars, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They wanted to put on people who were getting jobs because of what the local Adventist church was doing. So that's uh, just a bit of the journey there. Oh. And now that little church that you saw before, right there, we are, have broken ground and we're in the process of building this. How? Community outreach. We're growing. And let me tell you, Buena Vista is a small rural town of 8,000 people. And the closest town is about six miles away. That's another 8,000. After that, there's nothing. Okay, so this doesn't just happen in metropolitan areas where there's a lot of people. It's simply Ellen White's counsel about how to go about doing it. And obviously community is four-fifths of that uh, equation that she told us about. Even us as a conference have gotten on board with reaching out to the community. When I say conference, I mean the conference office. There's about 42 of us that are in the office. and. We found out about a battered women's shelter that was uh, just about five miles from where the office is. And uh, this place was very run down. Now, when battered women need a place to go to, they're, they're in a whole lot of stress at that time. They're fearful. Usually either kids are with them. Um, life is just very, very scary for them right now. So when they need to leave, they don't want to go to another place that just they're almost not glad to be there. You know, it's just so run down. So we decided um, to, at first we thought, well, we're going to take one of the rooms and we're going to completely gut it and put new furniture in and new bedding and paint it and everything else. Then we decided, why not do the whole house? And so that's what we did. We painted the entire house. We put flooring, new flooring in the entire house. We made up all the different bedrooms um, for the families to stay. We redid the bathrooms. We did everything. Um, and we had a whole lot of fun doing it. And then about three months ago, we got a card from the director. And she said, uh, Dear Potomac Conference, it's been exactly one year now since you came and remodeled our house. She went on to say, it's very interesting to see the reaction when people come into a place that's warm and inviting. Emotionally and mentally, they already start to feel better. Just simply by having a comfortable bedroom to feel safe in. So again, just many different ways of going beyond the walls. Uh, there's a need of coming close to the people, Ellen White says, by personal effort. If less time were given to sermonizing and more time were spent in personal ministry, greater results would be seen. The poor are to be relieved, the sick cared for, the sorrowing and the bereaved comforted, the ignorant instructed, the inexperienced counseled. We are to weep with those that weep and rejoice with those that rejoice, accompanied by the power of persuasion, the power of prayer, the power of the love of God. This work will not cannot be without fruit. Do you know where this comes from? It's the very next paragraph after Christ's method alone will bring true success. This work will not, cannot 
It can't fail. It's not like, well, let's do this and hope it works. She gives us the promise that it will. And that's, there's very few things guaranteed in ministry, right? <laughs> but this is one, one of them. I love the way Roger Hernandez said this years ago when I was uh, listening to him someplace. He said, marry your missions and date your methods. Now think about what that means. The ultimate mission is to reach people, right? That's the mission. How we do that can vary. That's the methods. But you know what we tend to do? We tend to flip this on its head. We marry the method. That's the way it's always been done. And that's the way it's got to be done. Yeah, it hasn't worked the last 17 times, but this is the way you're supposed to do it. And then we get kind of haphazard about the mission. Well, they didn't come to the last evangelistic series, so that's their problem. We told them. So when they burn in hell one day, don't look at me. No. Marry the mission of reaching the people, but how to go about doing that? Let's be flexible. I have two numbers up here, 122, 114. 122 is the number of recorded instances we find in the Gospels of Jesus interacting with people in all four Gospels. 114 of them are outside of the temple and synagogue. It's out there. So when Jesus was interacting, it wasn't just on Sabbath morning, happy Sabbath, to his fellow church members. You could see the 90-some percent what that is, is him being out there. I thought that was very interesting when I ran across that and how involved Jesus was with people outside of the comfort of the four walls of the church. I have a little video I want to show you that was... Uh, done by some company, and I think it's a little humorous, but it gets the point across. Take a look at this. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Community Safari, where each home is an exciting adventure. Here's our first stop. This is Jana. She's a single mom with three boys. She hardly has time for herself. Simple tasks like gathering food for her offspring is quite stressful. This aggressive behavior between the boys is often a result of the lack of a male role model in their lives. Let's withdraw from this situation and let the mother bear tend to her cubs. Okay, now for some excitement and drama. This is Rick and Catherine. They've been married for six years. No, 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 no. Bell banging on the glass and keep your hands in the vehicle at all times. These can be very aggressive animals. And as with any aggressive animal, do not look them in the eye. Oh, no. Someone's looked him in the eye. Look away. Look this? away. Remember to keep calm. Do not look directly in the eye. Oh, nice. Play dead. Take a Play picture. Dead. It'll last longer. Well, it looks like our time here is done. All righty. Let's keep moving forward, folks. On the left is Greg. He is leaving for his third job interview this week. As you can see, the female is grooming the male for the job hunt. Greg still has his family and his dignity. Oh, never mind. There goes that one. Not off to a great start, but let's hope that job hunt goes better. Wish there was something we could do to help him. Well, let's keep moving. This is one of the most popular stops and the most requested as well. This is Mimi. She is one of the senior adults in our kingdom, also known as a silver top. Do you think we should help her? She has recently been widowed as her husband passed away this last summer. Simple tasks like lawn care and taking out the trash have become quite difficult for her. Oh, she fell! Okay, ladies and gentlemen, as you can see, she's, she's trapped, it looks like. I need you to calmly get back in your seats. We need to let nature run its course and calmly remove ourselves. Let's head back to the church, shall we? It's cold. And I need to mow my grass. You know, the great thing about going back to the church is, you know, you're safe. So remember, folks, it's a wild and dangerous place in your community. So be grateful and thankful you have the safety of your own church. <laughs> the community safari. Hmm. Sometimes things are best get across by interjecting a little humor into them. And there was families there with obvious needs, and, and somehow... Uh, we don't recognize them. What do I do with my remote? Here it is. 
I want to share a couple of quotes with you now. Uh, these come from Leland Kaiser. Leland Kaiser, have it, any of you ever heard of him before? He was kind of like an Adventist futurist, is the way I would describe him. And he says, most of what current Seventh-day Adventist churches do is not relevant to the lives of most of the families and neighborhoods. As long as we stay inside our walls and talk to each other or run large evangelistic programs where we expect people to come to our churches, we will continue to be irrelevant to the world around us. What we need is a reformation in our church ministry. Our work is primarily outside our walls. We must take our message to the people where they are, in their homes, in their neighborhoods, at the workplace, and at play. It's no longer about the world coming to us. It's about us going to the world. This to me, this sentence right here, is no longer about the world coming to us. I am of the opinion is where most Adventist churches are still stuck. We run programs and events that are in our churches, and we want them to come to us. And we'll unpack that a little more, but we need to get beyond that. It's comfortable for us to do things in our own church, but is it the best approach? No. Now, Jesus called us to be fishermen of men, and I'm not a fisherman myself. Uh, I never have been, probably never will be. I just don't see the logic in it, I guess, but there's one thing I do know about fishing. To catch fish, you have to go where the fish are. I've never once been at home and heard a knock on my door, and there was a fish standing there saying, can I come in? <laughs> and this is exactly kind of what we expect for community people when it comes to churches. We expect them to come to us. And the best question is, why would we think that unless we already have built a relationship with them and they're comfortable with us? So there's a better, better way, thinking outside the church. And it's no coincidence that fast-growing churches are community-focused churches. In 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 41 and 42, we have the Old Testament approach, I would call it, that says this, people from other places will hear about your greatness and your power, talking about God, of course. They will come from far away to pray at this temple. So in the Old Testament, that was kind of the method, if you will. But God doesn't stay married to his methods. Instead, when Jesus came, he said, therefore, go. Interesting. Come, go. Are we trying to use Old Testament methods in New Testament times? That's another question to maybe ask ourselves. Uh, how many of you have read the book by, Go uh, what's his name? Um, oh, I can't even remember, sorry. But let me give you this quote. If and when a person engages the church as a means of finding spiritual, spiritual direction, he struggles with a barrier of culture. Those outside the church often feel like they have arrived at a convention of aliens when they attend their first church service. Now think about this. What is so normal and so natural for you and I to walk into a church is something that feels strange to many, many people. In fact, I've heard it expressed this way. The only place that secular people who've never been inside a church can identify with organ music and pews is a, is a funeral. So when they walk into something that looks like a funeral home, there's pews and there's organ playing, they're thinking, well, I didn't realize this was so much like a, am I at a funeral? Because that is their world, that is their context. And so we have to understand that this, for them to get out of a car and walk into a church where they have never been before, is much more difficult than we could possibly imagine. Think of the hardest thing it would be for you to do that would feel so awkward and so uncomfortable, and now you know how the people feel about coming to church. They simply do not understand what is taking place. It is as if the church speaks an entirely different language. But now notice the next sentence. 
The barrier, however, begins to break down when those outside to church meet, should be an, an authentic follower of Christ outside the church. So when does it begin to break down? When I get to know Wes. When I get to know Mike. And all of a sudden, the place is not so scary because that's where my friend Mike goes. People who participate in kindness ministries usually want to do it because of the sheer joy people get out of doing something nice for others. And it usually doesn't take long before people ask questions and start contacting the church, often with heartfelt thanks for these small acts of kindness. When such a church group takes out an ad in the paper or puts a flyer on the bulletin board, many who see the publicity are already favorably disposed toward the church. That's simply an extrapolation of what Ellen White said again in Ministry of Healing, page 143. Okay? All right. So the Bible has a term for what this is talking about. It's called ambassador. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. Give me some characteristics of an ambassador. And I'm talking about in the political sense. Okay, they represent the country that they are from. Okay, let's draw that correlation. We're representing who? Jesus. Okay, what else about ambassador? Where do they live? They live outside the country. They live in the place that they're trying to be an ambassador to. Right? Okay, so that is also built into that. What else about ambassador? I think I heard it back there. Okay, they do communicate back and forth. Uh, I was thinking about the culture you said earlier. They speak their language, exactly. They learn the culture. Uh, So all these things are wrapped up in the idea of us being Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. So the dictionary edition of an ambassador is actually this, an authorized representative or messenger, a person who represents his or her own government while living in another country. We also have a a problem in many Adventist churches, and I'm not sure if it's yours um, or not, but how many of our churches do our members even live in the community where the church is? It's like uh, they they, they want to live out in the, you know, away from where the church is and have their own life, uh, and church is something that they go to on Saturday mornings, but there's, there's no involvement in the very community where the church is. We call those bedroom churches because they just go there to sleep. <laughs> so remember, the key is that in everything we do, we're to represent the authority who sent us. Now, Matthew 5.16 says, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. There's not a lot of rocket science there, but I think there's also something that we often miss, so that they may see your good works. What that tells me is hide it under a bushel, no. Okay? Uh, If you're doing something for the community, let, let people know about it. Let the newspaper know about it. Let the local television know about it. Begin to get the word out. That's not bragging. That's not elevating yourself it's simply letting others see your good works and then the glory will go to God of course and not to us now it's not been our intent but so many of our good deeds take place within the bushels of our churches we do good yes but here's something else we usually do good to one another And there's nothing wrong with that, but let me give you an illustration of a church in our conference recently that did a wonderful thing, and I just thought, "Mm, if only. They had a church member who was in a wheelchair. Uh, I don't know if permanently paralyzed or paraplegic, quadriplegic. I'm not sure, but anyway, this person was in a wheelchair, and they didn't have enough money. Uh, This person didn't have enough money for a van, one of those handicapped vans. So the church got together, and they purchased a van for this church member. I thought, that's really, really nice. Mm. But somehow, I think it just would have been a little nicer 
if that was for a handicapped person in the community. Just think the power that that would have had. Or could they have said, you know, we're not going to buy one van. We're going to buy two. This is our goal, not this. So anyway, just for whatever that's worth, we, we do good to ourselves. But let's think about others outside the church. Now, I have to mention an email I received uh, a few years ago from a young pastor who pastored way out in Appalachia. Now, Appalachia is the mountainous area of southwest Virginia and southeast West Virginia. It is the poorest econ social economic area in the United States. And um, he was pastoring a church down there, uh, one of our churches that happens to be located there. And he was only part-time at the time, but this young pastor had a lot of fire. And so he realized that in his community, in such a very, very poor community, it's also coal mine country, he said, we need to help these people have hope. We need to help them find maybe better employment or, or something. So this little church of about 20 people decided to host a job fair. And in this job fair, um, they didn't just uh, put up a poster on the telephone pole somewhere in town and said, come to the blank Seventh-day Adventist Church for a job fair. The pastor started going out into the community and talking to business leaders. He went to Wells Fargo Bank. And he said, Mr. President, if we have a job fair, would you be willing to come and um, send a representative and help people to get a job? And then he'd knock on another door, another door. By the time he was done, he had several local businesses come to, now, this was a case of where they came, OK? Um, but see the, the better good here. Um, this was a case of where there were several local businesses that came. And they set up their little kiosks in the school gymnasium to welcome the people. But then he didn't stop there. Starting at 9 o'clock that morning, he and some others in the church held seminars, how to interview for a job. Was one, OK? Um, another one was, let me look at my notes here. Uh, how to develop a resume. How to identify key skills they possessed how to list potential references, how to practice job interviewing skills, how to set goals. So when they went to talk to these business representatives, they weren't just going up without any idea of what they were supposed to do, present themselves. They were now trained. By the end of that day, let me take a look at my number here. By the end of that day, well, first of all, 60 applicants applied for jobs that day. Uh, several companies were physically present on site to conduct interviews and help applicants successfully apply to the company. Uh, as attendees entered, they were given a community interest survey and were told that the church wanted to continue doing good things in the community. So you, as part of the community, can you give us the church ideas as to what can be done? And he ends the email by saying this. Many companies agreed to continue helping better the community. Wells Fargo said that they will return, return to our church to host a finance seminar. The University of Virginia in Wise County said that they would like to participate with us to organize a public outreach community for the county. And Old Dominion University has agreed to fully fund another job fair if we decide to host it. And of course, we will. At the end of the fair, 15 people signed up, and on that community interest survey card, they had a little box here that said, interested in Bible studies. 15 people signed up, and five people got jobs that day. How do you think those people feel about that church? How do you think the local businesses feel about that church? Do you think that church is still just that? What's that Adventist building there? They know who these people are now. And so it's just an amazing opportunity of what can happen when you begin to think outside the church. Now, everything I said right now is kind of examples in theory. I want to get to the real brass tacks now. How to get started, where to find ideas, and following the process. 
okay? Step one, make sure the outreach you are offering aligns with the needs of the community. Let me give you an example of how not to do that. Vegetarian cooking schools in the church kitchen. Is there anything wrong with the vegetarian cooking school? In and of itself, no. But do you think that the, one of the most felt needs in your community is people want to become vegetarians? No. So why do we do it? Because it makes us feel good. Because it's something we're comfortable doing. It's because we know how to do that. Let alone that it's not really reaching out to people. Another example of this, and again, I don't have any problems per se about any of these things, but it can't be the method. Concerts. Concerts at your local church. Inviting artists in. There's nothing wrong with that. But why not have that same concert and sponsor it someplace that's more neutral? Okay? Um, I, 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 there are churches that have a whole concert ministry. And what's interesting to me is I followed this one particular church over the years. They get a lot of people coming to the concerts. How many people actually end up being changed at the end of it? But in their eyes, it's very successful because they're comfortable doing it. Okay? So don't assume you know what the community needs are. We have to find the research. How do you do that? Well, surveys is one way of doing it. Um, go on the website for your local newspaper and start entering keywords. Uh, healthcare, uh, crime, uh, education. And see how many times those subjects come up. The more they come up, the more that's in the consciousness of the community that in which you are. And so begin to start gearing your felt needs approach towards those kinds of topics. Go talk to your mayor and the city mothers and fathers. They know what's going on in the community. That's their job, okay? Um, also, uh, let me see. Let me make sure I'm not jumping ahead of myself. Yeah, I am just a little there. So the other thing I want to mention is at, at my current church, the Beginning Vista Church, when I was pastoring there 10 or more years ago, I held a contest and I had already gotten them thinking about how important it is to go beyond the walls, to reach people in the community. And I said, you probably have ideas. Now that you've been exposed to some ideas and the juices are flowing, I want to hear what you think would be a good idea. You live here. I don't, okay? I actually was pastoring a, a big district, and I lived halfway between the two. And uh, so we had a contest, and I said, here's the deal. Bring those ideas to the church board anonymously, and whichever ones get the most vote is going to get an all-expense-paid Italian dinner at the Labates. And my wife can cook an Italian dinner like you won't believe. And so we had a little fun with it, and they came up with all kinds of good ideas. And so um, ask your people is another way of finding out uh, what those ideas are. And while we implemented the first two right away, we now had a list to supply us for months going forward. Number two, you have to identify and learn the demographics of your community. You cannot assume. Let me give you an example. When I was pastoring the Stanton, Virginia Church, where our conference headquarters are in Potomac Conference, um, when I would look around the immediate houses around the church, it seemed like it was fairly affluent people. So then we decided to get an actual demographic study done. And what I found out blew me away. In a one-mile radius around the church, 34% of all residences were single moms. Why did that blow me away? Because visually, I thought that wasn't the case at all. I saw these nice houses, you know, within a quarter mile of the church and thought that's what our community was like. But you go out just a little further, and the truth began to reveal itself. And by the way, what is the largest unchurched demographic in the United States today? 
single moms. What is the lowest hanging fruit of any secular individual in the United States today? Single moms. If you're not into single moms ministry, you are missing a boatload of opportunities. Right, Griselda? Griselda, if there's time, I want you to stand up and talk about your single mom's ministry. Okay, so learn to identify your demographics. Here's just some examples. You could go to citydata.com, enter in your state, your city. There'll be pages and pages of demographic information that you could find out. Um, I just went to uh, online and typed in uh, Montgomery County. Washington, D.C. is right here. Okay, and Montgomery County is uh, the county just north of Washington, D.C. And this is just simply basic demographic information. This is population density, okay? Uh, let's see, let's hold an evangelistic series or you know, let's do some community outreach work uh, right here. <laughs> if you don't have this, you just might do that <laughs> because your head elder lives here, okay? And the church is located right here, okay? No, <laughs> this tells you, gives you the information. Here's the population change, the areas that are growing the most. And as you can see by the colors, it's really starting to spread out here. When people move, that's when they're most open to change as well. So it's good to know where the new communities are. Um, graduate professional degree, there's the breakdown there as well. Hispanicity. This I thought was fascinating. I subscribed to this company, Claritas. Have any, any of you ever heard of Claritas before? Yeah. Some of you have, good, okay. Claritas is the foremost um, business demographic, if you will, in the country. In other words, when Panera says, we want to open up another branch, um, they don't say, they don't throw a dart at a map. Say, oh, let's build one there, hope it helps. There's a whole lot of study that goes into the type of uh, expendable income people may have about going out to eat. Where do they go when they go out to eat? What is the price range that they pay? What's the, you know, all those kind of demographics. And then when they build a Panera there, they're not hoping it succeeds. They know it will, okay? And it's based upon information you can get from this company called Claritas. And we tend to think, right, Raphael? Because we were just talking about this the other day. All Hispanic people are the same. Where did we ever get that idea? Maybe they speak Spanish, but even their Spanishes can be very different one from another. So we looked into different Hispanic demographics, and Claritas divided them into five categories. And this is what they call the Nueva Latina. And it's 29% of the U.S. Hispanic population. You can find out all things about them, okay? Uh, even to the television programs they watch. Uh, MTV Movie Awards was the highest indexing special TV program watched in the last 12 months. <laughs> They're most likely to use Verizon as their wireless phone color. They're likely to eat a Taco Bell or Church's Chicken. They shopped at Walmart, Supercenter, or Sam's Club. All kinds of fascinating in information that helps you to identify who are the people in your community. What do they like? What do they do? What are they interested in? Even their tech usage. Look where they are in high tech. Where do you think their parents are? <laughs> right? Over here, okay? so. This is some demographic information that will help you to know your community. Piney Forest Church. <laughs> we have the pastor, Piney Forest, right here. This was an article that was in The Visitor a few years ago. And I want to read the first couple of paragraphs to you. It's probably kind of small. According to the US Census Bureau, nearly 10 million single mother-led families exist in this country. Single moms are one of the fastest growing segments of population in the region of Danville, Virginia, explains Brenda Kilgore, the single moms ministries coordinator for the Piney Forest Church. After studying local demographics and discussing ways to improve service to the community, the congregation felt called to minister to this population. Kilgore, a former single mother of 15 years, explains, we discovered there was no organization catering to this demographic within 60 miles. None. 
No other church, no government agency, no community, none. And through statistical data, we learn two out of three single moms don't attend church. This means their children are more susceptible to poverty, abuse, and jail time. And she continues on. And in the first couple of years, there were about 17 single moms they grew to at meeting at the Piney Forest Church. Pastor Griselda has been there about six months and has doubled to 30-something. Um, single moms being loved on by their local Adventist church. All right, step three. Look for and create ideas that meet the needs of the community. Again, don't think vegetarian cooking school here, okay? <laughs> if you don't have these three books in your library, these are th probably the three best books you could buy when it comes to thinking outside the church. They're all written by Steve Sogren, who's kind of like the, the guru, if you will, of churches going into the community. This one is just very simple. It's just simply 101 ways to reach your community. And it's ju they're just bulleted, okay? Conspiracy of kindness, irresistible evangelism, natural ways to open doors to Jesus. Um, so get those, give them to your board members or other leaders and go at it. And once again, the, um, that article. Okay, now, step four, follow the process and stay consistent for at least five years. You know one of the reasons we don't do community outreach? You don't get results right away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is something that is, I, I, I picture it as a train pulling out of a station. It's very slow at first, but there's a lot there. And once you get going and once you get up to speed, look out. That train is going to do a lot of uh, good stuff. So there needs to be, we're in this for a period of time. You might hold a community event and three people might show up. And you say, well, that didn't work. Really? You're going to make that judgment after one time? Why not debrief and see, is there anything we missed? Do we need to get more word out? You know, we talk to people who came and ask them to bring others next time. You need to stay consistent with this. Now, when I was um, pastoring the Buena Vista Church and also uh, Church in the Valley, um, when we had our first ACTS, the Alder Grove Computer Training School, um, it wasn't the home run right out of the gate. But we knew that this had to be a felt need. The, the demographics and the information told us that the community we were in was unemployed and underemployed. And so that train just started mo moving down the tracks. And pretty soon, this became a, kind of synonymous almost with the church. The Breakfast Club. My wife was one of the pioneers of the Breakfast Club, um, of them going to the local elementary school and feeding kids a hot breakfast. When we started. We, that list, that everything that the Church in the Valley was doing, we didn't do all that at one time. <laughs> we started with one. And we stayed with that for two years. And then we thought, okay, we think we have enough bandwidth to maybe add something else now. And that's when we added the Breakfast Club. And so, again, you need to stay with it. Be consistent. Don't, don't give up. When uh, I was pastoring the Buena Vista Church and we first started talking about that, I got to tell you, when I talked to them about going out in the community and doing these things, they were, they were like, ah, really? I mean, we can't, we can't do all that. I said, did I ask you to, that we should do all that? <laughs> Let's just do one this year, just one. Okay? Let's pick one, and we'll do just that. And we did that, and they realized, hey, that wasn't too terribly time-consuming or hard. So I said, so you think we could do two next year? Yeah, let's do two. So let's add a second. Why well, we keep, kept the first one, okay? By year four, they were saying, come on, pastor, isn't there anything else we could do in the community? They had caught the vision, the energy, and they were now pulling me along because of um, their excitement about what it looks like to go out into the community. So make it something innovative. Make it something different but make it still meet real needs, okay? 
Maybe ask the question again, would the newspaper or news station want to do a story on this? If the answer is no, you may want to think of something else. If it's yes, you're on to something. All right. So, so far, how much time do I have left? When, when do we end here? 11.15? 10.40? But what time is it now? Four minutes. Okay. The principal of the Lego. <laughs> the principal of the Lego. Everybody knows what a Lego brick is. It has these little pegs on. Your life is like a Lego brick. You have family on this peg. So I have 14 minutes? Oh. Okay. All right. You have family on this peg. You have your personal pastoral job on this peg. You have uh, exercise and personal growth on this peg. You have um, uh, you know, the kids' school on this peg. The, the point is, is that most of our Lego pegs are full. And when we talk about doing more things, especially to your people whose Lego pegs are full, they go, oh, no, I don't have the energy for that. I don't have the time for that. Let me share a story about somebody who really got this. One of their Lego pegs was every Thursday night, they went out to eat with two other really good church friends in, in the church, another couple. And they said, you know what? For the sake of personal going outside the church, would you mind, this couple, if for the next year, we didn't go out on Thursday nights, but instead that we go out with that other couple that we've been praying about? They simply replaced their Lego peg with the friends that they did stuff with at church with another couple that they were trying to reach for Jesus. So it didn't create more stress in their life, more responsibility, more time. They simply adjusted one of their Lego pegs. This is something that you may want to share with your people. You know, again, as a pastor at a church, you may be doing all you feel you can. It might be, what do we have on a Lego peg that we're currently doing that we could take off to put this on instead? I'm not asking you to do more. I'm just asking us to do something different. Okay? And that will be a lot more palatable as well. All right. Again, talking about personal going beyond the walls, Luke 5. But the Pharisees and the men who taught the law for the Pharisees began to complain to Jesus' followers. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? How many of us would like to be accused of that? That would be a wonderful epitaph to put on my tombstone. Which means he was where? Was he in church? No. Jesus answered them, it's not the healthy people who need a doctor, but sick. And when she talks about this, um, what did I do here? Oh, I advanced it. I read the second verse first. Let me go back. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax collector's booth. Jesus said to him, follow me. So Levi got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi gave a big dinner for Jesus at his house. Many tax collectors and other people were eating there too, and that's where we had the next verse. Now, Desire of Ages gives us a little insight a little later that's pretty cool. She says, when the Holy Spirit was poured out and 3,000 were converted in a day, there were among them many who first heard the truth at the table of Matthew's dinner. And some of these became messengers of the gospel. Lego peg. He invited those people over to his personal house for dinner. A personal going beyond the walls. All our friends don't have to be the people in our churches. All right, I don't have time to give my testimony in detail. I will just tell it in very, very quick bullet format. I didn't grow up Adventist. I became an Adventist when I was 14 years old. Excuse me, I was baptized when I was 14 years old, but I started to have some interest when I was about, actually as young as nine or 10, and you know why? Because an Adventist family who had a boy that was my age somehow found out about us, came over to the house and said, do you think Ricky would want to come play softball with the church on Sunday nights at the park? I would. Couldn't think of anything else I'd rather do. And so I went playing softball with the Allentown, Pennsylvania church on Sunday nights during the summer. And I became friends with this 
this boy, his name was Glenn, he was my best friend growing up. And then, based on that friendship, I started going to the church that he went to, and there was this nice old couple that lived um, a few miles away, and on the way to the church, our house was on the way, and they would come and they would pick me up, 10, 11 years old, and take me to church. And when I got to that church, all the adults were so kind to me, and I thought, this is so different than the environment I growing up in. And uh, so one thing led to another, and finally, you know, four or five years after I first started playing softball, I became uh, baptized, first Adventist in my family. And obviously, I've been a pastor now for um, 42 years. Uh, the point is this, what started it at all? Playing softball at a local park. It's how Jesus found me. Outside of the church. Uh, the opportunities for us to reach people outside of the church are limitless. I close with a quote, and then I think we have a few minutes for some Q&A. Somebody wrote this. I would hope people would look at us talking about Adventists. Uh, no, actually not talking about Adventists. This is in the book called Unchristian. And say, those Christians are the ones who run in when everyone else is running out. Those Christians are the ones who didn't give up on our crumbling inner cities. Those Christians are the ones who put an end to human trafficking. Those Christians are the ones who helped my mother when she got Alzheimer's. Those Christians are the ones who were kind to me when I was new to the area. Those Christians are the ones that made me want to believe in God. So, um, thinking outside the church, my experiences, it works. And it works well. Questions? Comments? No? Okay, yes. Okay, good, good question. Uh, we had an attendance of about 200, uh, grew to 450, and now uh, it's almost 1,000. Yes and no. There are some things as 20 people, you can't go out and buy a minivan for a single mom, okay? Um, but the principle of simply finding a need in the community and identifying it and meeting it, you could do that with three people, not just 20. So it's, it's principles I wanna, want you to take away from this, not the particulars of what was done, okay? Yeah, date the methods, yes. Mm -hmm. But we have to agree that they are harder to reach out. Yeah, they are. What, what would you suggest? Wealthy people have needs too. And believe it or not, one of the demographic identifiers of wealthy people is financial security. Because money is their driver in life. Okay? And they're afraid of losing it, how to stay on top, things like that. Um, anything dealing with finances, it's going to automatically grab their attention. So, um, what's the guy's name? The finance, Christian finance guru, Dave Ramsey. Ramsey. Ramsey, thank you. His finance seminar has been shown to work in wealthy communities as well. Um, good, good. Off, off, my wife is a nurse, a home health nurse, and she's been to many, many different homes. And she comes back, she tells me, without a doubt, those that are the most wealthy also have the most inner strife going on. Uh, yeah. Uh, Tom? Yeah, as a therapist, Amen. I was going to say that I've seen a lot of wealthy people that have family problems. Yes. Kid, yep. Exactly. You have your hand up? Yeah. So I was going to comment on that to say that I found in my experience where I pass on now that uh, the wealthy people have um, emotional issues. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that I've, uh, I'm trying to do now in my church, I'm new there, um, I have, we've come up with a strategic plan for our community. Uh, some of these ideas resonate with me because we are trying them as well. And one of the greatest assets I've found is that my connection with the mayor 
um, when I went to his office and I introduced myself and I was talking to him about the vision that I have for the community and I collaborate with him. He was so excited that he called the entire council and I was in the midst of it presenting and uh, he assigned people ready to work with me. Uh, he's coming to my church and he wants to give me a part of his budget. Wow, fantastic, fantastic. And also stress. Stress seminars really resonate with wealthy people. Yes. Uh, uh, first of all, thank you for your presentation. Welcome. The question is, once you identify the need in your community, you get your church on board, and you have a project in place, what is the best, what are some of the best methods or ways that we can bring the community in? Is it through uh, advertising in the community? Is it going door to door, letting people know? Is it through simply relationships in the church? What? You know what, demographics will help you answer that question. What is the best delivery method? Um, social media, you can't be social media in the world we're in. Facebook is um, very key for anything like this. So I would say you go to social media first and then check out the demographics and see what else the demographics recommend. You're welcome. Yes, Griselda. I think, uh, you know, as, as this one of the two churches I have right now, uh, the, what's new in the community, I don't know. And I went to social media, I signed up in two or three different community going on in, in town and I found out that they have a lot of needs in these uh, 300 apartments of, you know, home, you know, housing. So we tried to reach out, we, we got the, uh, the right person and uh, I just say in the church, you know, it's a very small church. Right now we need 20 members. Mm -hmm. I said, who wants to meet me? Uh, I'm going to be having a meeting in this housing at, you know, Monday at 8.30 in the morning to see how we can help. I was surprised. 15 came. Mm. Mm. Wow. Good. So, Fantastic. Big meeting uh, because they see our, you know, our urgency, our response. They give us 150 apartments. It's totally empty, two rooms, kitchen, and they give a lot of supplies, and they say, you do whatever you want to help. Beautiful. And it's just where we're working right now. You don't have to have 200, 500 member, members. It's just pray, <coughs> go do something, and see how God does. Amen. Very good. Yes, Hannah. Oh, Andre. Ha ladies first, and then Andre. Hannah. How do you make our churches less like alien conventions? I'm sorry? How do you make our churches look less like alien conventions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there's a whole series of books written on something like that. Um, good question. You know, I don't know right offhand, okay? Uh, one thing for us is that we got to stop our adventees that we use when we talk, okay? Um, there is what's called the Ritz-Carlton principle that I think would work in any circumstance. And that is, if people feel valued, and, they, and we really want to serve them, they'll help get over that, that hump. But a personal connection with somebody is still the biggest thing to be able to not make them feel like aliens. But in order to actually make that happen at Adventist churches, um, I don't know right, Alphan. You, you find out, and then you teach the seminar next year. Okay, Andre? Great. Knowing that um, in our culture, some of the, our members of even the officials in the church are driven by finance. How did you uh, come to get uh, your people in the, in the church in the uh, in the valley to move on with those ideas, knowing that some of the things that you had to explain really cost. Um, vision casting. You could you give a compelling vision. There's no uh, stopping it. Uh, again, it doesn't it doesn't happen overnight. But you give the vision, you cast it, you keep casting it, uh, and it will come. Did you have outside um, funding as well as internal? Oh, good question. Good question. Yeah, where did we get the money to buy minivans and redo homes and things like that? Um, now, this is something that will vary according to your location, but where we were in Church in the Valley is a big golfing community. 
So we decide to host a golfing tournament, okay? Now, we charge for that, but here's what else we did. We got creative with it. We contacted some famous people. And we said, um, like a professional hockey player up there or a famous actress or, you know, and we said, we want to raise money to help people in the community. Would you be willing to come and be kind of like the figure of this? And so people are paying three, five hundred dollars to say, I golf with J Lo today. Do you know that? Um, and then we rented a helicopter and we had golf balls and everybody put their initials on the golf ball. And we put all those golf balls in the box. And the helicopter hovered above the practice screen. And then somebody in the helicopter turned the box upside down. All these golf balls fell out. And the golf ball that was closest to the hole won a prize. OK? And there was people paying to be part of that. So these, this kind of event um, generated close to half a million dollars over a period of eight years. Yeah. Yes. One of the things that um, we had a seminar yesterday um, talking about um, key principles for evangelism. One of the things that was mentioned was um, life is remembered in moments. So if you create, if you use these events to create moments in people's heads, they're going to remember. Yeah, that was a super fun experience. And when you attach it to the idea that yeah, the Seventh Day at the church, at the church was funding it. That's going to keep staying in people's minds. People are going to start to get curious. They're going to start to reach out. And as you were saying before, we can't do it where we have the strings attached. Because if we do that too often, people are just going to think, oh, those guys are just going to evangelize. I might as well not go if I'm just going to be tested with God all the time. But you let them come to their own conclusion. Yeah. And they're going to walk instead of being dragged. In. Right. Yeah. You build a bridge, they'll walk across it. Ebby. How we, oh, by the way, how are we doing on time? Yeah. Bad? <laughs> are we done? Yeah. Okay, I don't want to hold you. Feel free to get up and leave. And get up. Contact your local council. Yeah. They have funds available from the county. The only thing is you have to work you know, in whatever way you want to do. But you can connect it to one of the funds that are available there. And I met my uh, local council member, and she made me connect with three people who are right there in that meeting. Okay. Local government, businesses, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you so much for coming. Appreciate your participation.